For this week's clinical file, we have McKenna, and McKenna has a history of hyperparathyroidism and is being treated in physical therapy. Which of the following manifestations is the most likely to be observed? So we have A, diarrhea, B, development of acute flank pain, C, diminished deep tendon reflexes, and D, is increased bone density. So let's go up to the top of this question. As you see here, we're getting on into a little bit of that, what, uh, metabolic, endocrine, uh, a little bit of that other system. So you really have to understand your glands very well and what are the different hormones that are produced and what do those hormones do? So let's go ahead and break this one down. McKenna has a history of hyperparathyroidism. Notice how we didn't say thyroid like hyperthyroidism. No, the thyroid and the parathyroid are two different endocrine glands. And we really have to look at what is this whole hyperparathyroidism? Like what is this condition? What does the parathyroid even do? Okay, well, hyper, we know that's increased or overactive. Parathyroid is a hor or is a uh, endocrine gland that secretes a hormone called, does anybody know? Parathyroid hormone, check that out. Uh, not that not that difficult, right? Parathyroid hormone. And this particular hormone, does anybody know what it does? This particular hormone, when it's released, it actually increases this thing called osteoclastic activity. Y'all, y'all remember osteoclast back way back when? Oh, I can't remember where that was. That was orthopedics, maybe. I, I Kinesiology, I can't even remember now. But it's in one of those class classes where we talked about osteoclast, and they break down the bone. They they allow for bone reabsorption. Well, what's one of the, the elements that's involved in bone? One of the major ones is calcium. So what do I need you to remember right now is that the uh, the parathyroid releases parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid uh, parathyroid hormone is going to increase osteoclastic activity. Bottom line, it's going to break down that bone and put the calcium where? Where's the calcium going to go? Not onto your skin. It's going to go into your bloodstream. So when a patient has hyperparathyroidism, one of the, 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 the negatives of that, one of the, the consequences is hypercalcemia, too much calcium that starts to get into that bloodstream, all right? So we got a patient here with hyperparathyroidism who is now being treated in physical therapy, okay? Now, the, the stem of the question, the last sentence here says, which of the following uh, manifestations is the most likely to be observed. And for those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answers one more time for you. We got A, which is diarrhea. B is development of acute flank pain. C is diminished deep tendon reflexes or DTRs. And D is increased bone density. All right, so I wanna knock these down one by one. I told you what, we had hyperparathyroidism. The patient is now more than likely having hypercalcemia. It's very common. So what can we expect? Really, I think that this is what the question's really asking you. If a patient has hypercalcemia, what are we expecting to find in that patient? So we look at A, do we expect diarrhea? Is that common to be found in this? So here's the thing. The answer to that is no. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you the short answer to that. It's no. It's actually constipation. I would be looking for, but I think it's really important for you to understand. I think it's important for you to understand why we get it, though. All right. Do you remember in school? And I know this may want make you want to vomit right now. I get that. You may be. Like, eh, eh. Wait. He's gonna start talking about neuro. Oh gosh. Okay. Do you remember those voltage gated sodium channels? You may or may not remember those, right? And uh, that's very important uh, important part of nerve conduction, but also muscle contraction is those sodium channels. Well, here's the thing: when someone has a lot of calcium in their bloodstream. What it does is it, it it keeps the cells from being able to depolarize. 
it keeps the sodium from being able to move very easily through their channels. And if sodium doesn't move very easily through the channels, guess what? We don't get very good signaling. We don't get very good depolarization. All right. And so what this does is it slows nerve conduction. Well, if we slow nerve conduction, aren't we going to slow down the muscle contraction? Yup. And if we slow down muscle contraction and we may make the muscles weak, what does that, what does that do to your GI tract? What does that do to the GI tract? Well, if the muscles are not contracting very well, you end up with things called con constipation. All right. And so that's the reason why I'm going to get rid of a here. That's mm -mm. I'm expecting more constipation from this patient, not diarrhea. All right. One thing that you need to write down in your notes there was definitely that relationship between calcium and sodium. All right. Let's go down to B. B says development of acute flank pain. I'll tell you all right now for those on the podcast that so many people put B. So let's go into this one to see if it's the right answer. I think a lot of people put B because they were thinking of how a patient with hypercalcemia tends to end up with uh, kidney stones. And we know kidney stones can cause flank pain, right? Okay. So here's the thing. The one thing about kidney stones is that they actually produce more mid lumbar pain that radiates into the flank. So that one's kind of like, uh, okay, development of acute flank pain. All right. But there's a lot of other things that could cause acute flank pain as well. Pancreatitis can cause acute flank pain. Uh, UTI could cause a flank pain as well. So it's like, mm, okay, somewhat of a stretch, but... In the question, it says, McKenna has a history of hyperparathyroidism being treated in physical therapy. Which of the following manifestations is most likely to be observed? Like, when we're treating this patient right now, the patient will have acute flank pain. Mm, I mean, they're likely to get kidney stones, but is it so likely that the patient's walking in with one today? Mm, I, I don't know about that. Or to develop acute flank pain while we're exercising or working with them in PT. I'm kind of like, ah, I think that's kind of a stretch. I still like it because kidney stones are something that is very common in this patient population. So I like this answer. I'm not getting rid of it. I'm just saying that there are some things where I'm kind of like, eh, all right. So I'm going to put, uh, uh, can I put a little check mark next to it for now? All right, let's go to C. C says diminished DTRs. Mm. Is this true or not? Okay. Well, there are some people who wrote to me specifically and said C was the right answer. Now, there's a lot of people who said it wasn't. And the reason why is they open, they cracked open their pathology book. And in the section where it says hyperparathyroidism, guess what one of the findings is? increased DTRs. And that's where so many people got it from. But they're taking it out of context, though, because in that chart, it also says early, early symptoms would be increased DTRs. But actually, after the patient has a history of it, it diminishes the DTRs. So a patient with a history of hyperparathyroidism, a patient who has chronic hyperparathyroidism, is going to present to you with diminished DTRs. However, a patient who just shows up to you with acute hyperparathyroidism may actually have increased DTRs. That is one little tricky thing that you gotta make sure that you're watching out for when you're reading things in the textbook. Our patient here in this question has a history of hyperparathyroidism. So I actually expect diminished DTRs. I do expect this, 100%. All right. So I'm liking it. And, you know, if you need me to go back to be like, well, why? Why am I seeing diminished DTRs? It goes back to the same idea of the calcium and sodium. I said to remember that that uh, voltage gated sodium channels. And how that's so important for nerve conduction, how it's so important for the whole depolarization. Well, if there's a lot of calcium in the bloodstream, it's like calcium stops sodium from being able to go through that channel. And if sodium doesn't go through the channel very well, we don't get good conduction. So how the heck are you going to have good DTRs if we're not having very good conduction? It's not going to happen. So a lot of times in a patient who has 
chronic hyperparathyroidism or a history of it, you see absent or diminished DTRs. I actually like C way more than I like B right now. I'm gonna go ahead, put a bigger check next to C, but hold on, we ain't done yet. Let's look at D. D says increased bone density. Mm. So that one we can already get out, put a nice X next to that, why? Because we said uh, parathyroid hormone, when there's a lot of it, what does it do? It increases osteoclastic activity, right? That's where we break down the bone. That's where we're pulling out the calcium, making the bones more brittle, making the patient at risk for, come on, hit me, osteopenia, yeah. And if that goes on for too long, we get osteoporosis. Y'all following me, yeah. All right, so I would expect decreased bone density, not increased. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put a big X next to that one. So for sure, I got out A, which was diarrhea. For sure, I got out D, which is increased bone density. I'm left with B as in boy and C as in cat. B was development of acute flank pain and C was diminished DTRs. Which one is more likely? Which of the following manifestations is most likely to be observed? Diminished DTRs. If you were between those two answers there, I feel you. But this final answer here is C. It's most likely that I'm going to see the diminished DTRs. Now, I know, I know, I know this is one of those questions where you kind of get down to it and you're like, ah, but couldn't it be the acute flank pain? The way that I think about it is I had to do a little bit extra in order to make B correct. What do I mean by that? I had to assume a few more things in order to make B the correct answer. I had to assume that it is an actual kidney stone. All right, I had to assume that the patient would get a kidney stone while at therapy in this specific circumstance. Like right now, they start to have a development of acute flank pain. So it's kind of like, uh, it's a little bit more of a stretch. But when I look at C, I'm like, for sure, a patient with hypercalcemia, one of the classic signs of hypercalcemia is diminished DTRs. Like it's a classic sign. It's, it's like a telltale sign or a hallmark sign as they call it. So there's no debating this one. So C is the best answer. And that's what we're looking for. All right, I hope that that helps you out. I know that this is always one of those where you're like, ah, I don't know which one to pick. Here's the thing though, anytime you get questions like this, I really debated whether I should put this question in, you know, and, and make this a question because, you know, it, it, you don't want things to be tricky. That's not the goal of the MPTE to be tricky at all. It's not the goal of any question to ever be tricky. All right, that's not the goal of this. The goal of this is to test whether you understand and you know the content or not. And so I was like, mm, you know, I'm kind of playing around with this question. Do I, do, should I put this in or not? Okay, so I think that there's two lessons that I want you all to take from this. Number one is maybe this is one of the questions that wouldn't have counted on your NPTE. Maybe it would have shown up and got you all flustered and you're like, oh, I don't know. And you start beating yourself up. But at the same time, the question didn't even count against you. But as you know, you sat back and you freaking flipped out because you didn't know this one. And so you wind up getting the next five questions wrong because you're too busy thinking about a question that didn't even count against you. So that's one of the things I want you to think about right now. As you're going through your questions, especially when it comes down to the MPTE, don't get so wrapped up in just one of them because half the time you don't even know if it counts against you or not. You just got to continue to dominate each freaking question one by one. All right. So that's one of the things. The other piece is when I look at this question, again, I want to make sure that I'm not doing too much assuming. I'm going with the answer that has the most support, that is the most likely. All right. Without doing any additional adding into the question, taking it off of face value. Those are my two suggestions for you. But as always, for those of you who need more help with this, um, you know, the way that I have become you know, very systematic in this process is by using a system. All right. So the pass system is from the MPT clinical files. I made it in order to help people answer questions just like I do. And so if you're looking to be able to dissect these questions in a way that the tester wants you to be able to do it, 
visit nptepass.com. It is the literal best way for me to teach you how to go through these questions just like I do it. Sounds good? All right. So for those of you on the podcast, go ahead and check your show notes. I got a cheat sheet in there to help you with this topic right here, hypercalcemia, understanding what the signs and symptoms are. I threw in some mnemonics for you as well. All right.